Music's not a mirror to reflect reality. It's a hammer, hammer, hammer. with which we shape it. Shape it. Yeah. When did you start rapping? So uh, I moved to the U.S. when I was seven, and um, English was my second language. Um, and part of the way I learned English was through listening to hip hop and writing down the words to my favorite songs, looking them up in a dictionary. And then <clears throat> eventually I started putting my own lyrics in them. And me and my best friend, my homegirl that lived next door to me, we used to like make up little songs using other people's lyrics and putting our words in instead, like over Casio beats. And you know, we were just playing around, having fun. So we were like nine years old, but we were doing that like regularly, you know, making up songs and, and writing raps over the Casio beats. Um, but when I started taking it seriously as an art form and a craft and practicing freestyle daily and writing a new song every day, recording all that, it was um, when I was 15. Did your music change like your message when you started rapping <coughs> change now? Oh, a lot. I mean, I learned so much. I always wanted to convey a message to my music. Like when I was um, when I was young, when I was um, first listening to hip hop. It was, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, you know, 88 through 92 or whatever. So that was the era when a lot of hip hop did have a very prominent message. And so I always um, looked at hip hop as a way for people to get out the stories that the media wasn't telling otherwise. So I always focused on doing that in my music, but still, like, over the years, I've just learned so much more about the nitty gritty of. <clears throat> you know, the, the topics I was, I was discussing or just, you know, more experiences or <clears throat> more experiences that I've had as a person or, you know, through my act or organizing and activism that I've been able to uh, see different things from various perspectives and then just grow as an artist too, you know, like uh, learn different writing techniques, learn different ways to approach a flow or a song. So how do you feel about <clears throat> the hip hop scene in Detroit? How big is it? Man, the hip-hop scene in Detroit is, is immense, you know, it's amazing. Uh, I've been honored to be a part of it since I was, you know, 15, 16, coming out here and, like I said, sneaking in the open mics and stuff like that. And, um, and basically, like, it's, you know, it's like any city, there's cliques and there's the crabs in a barrel mentality. Of course, when there's lack of opportunity, you always have people fighting over crumbs. But there's also a lot more opportunities here in recent years with people uh, doing things independently, releasing their own music, starting their own labels. Um, you have you know, a long musical history here beyond hip hop that everybody came up under. You know, like Finale, the uh, cat I rhyme with, like his grandfather was in the platters. Or like, you know what I'm saying, one of my homegirls that, that does poetry that I came up, you know, le you know, learning how to rhyme while she was learning how to write poetry. But like her uh, her mom went to elementary school, Stevie Wonder, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's like it's a small city. So everybody kind of came up in that realm of the Motown era and the jazz era and, you know, techno it started here too, you know, just all the musical movements that came out of the city so basically it's like a matter of um, people taking all that eclectic mix of inspiration and turning it into a really innovative form of hip-hop you know what I mean? How do you feel like Detroit? I didn't really know about the hip-hop scene until I heard of you in Alley mm -hmm. and I saw the show mm -hmm. last night and I'm just blown away. How do you feel when like the mainstream particularly you had Eminem Hip hop Detroit. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much Detroit for the mainstream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They look at Eminem. You know, it's crazy. I came up going to uh, the same open mics as D12 when they were Dirty Dozen, and you know what I'm saying? I was cool with Bugs and Proof. I saw Eminem around a lot. And, you know, Eminem was always, you know, a respected member of the scene. But, you know, when he blew up, it was obviously uh, he blew up to a very large scale because of, you know, not just his skills but also because of, you know, the, the, the appeal he had based off, you know, his race and based off his skin tone, and he acknowledges that, but, you know what I'm saying, it's just a certain, you know, certain gimmicks that his label would have him taking certain directions of his image and things like that, dying his hair, you know, blonde, and just a bunch of things that were different from how he was locally, where he kind of blended in the scene, you know what I'm saying, versus when he grew up, he kind of took it all the way, you know, to, uh, to the extreme of trying to, you know, just appeal to the masses, and so he kind of took that superstar status, but um, in a lot of ways people don't realize his skill is a reflection of all the skill here in the city. 
you know what I'm saying? And um, my friend Big Tone, he got a line in one of his rhymes. He just dropped a dope album too. He, he had a line in one of his songs where he was like, Shady is a diamond in the rough. But Shady's a diamond amongst diamonds in time people will find it. And it's like, to me, like the reason why you know, Slim Shady exists is because he came up in this immense, like diehard, raw MC culture where we all like challenge each other to be the best lyricist and we all, you know what I'm saying, come to the open mic with your new verse and try to outshine the next person and stuff like that. And people here have influence from the East Coast, the West Coast, the down south, it's the Midwest, you know what I'm saying? So we have all angles of influence. And um and so, you know, to me like it's really um exciting to finally see this whole scene of diamonds that Big Tone was talking about finally getting proper shine. You know what I'm saying? Whether it be black milk whether it be Slum Village, whether it be, unfortunately, after their passing, Poof and Dilla getting their shine, you know what I'm saying? But they deserved it because they were like the pillars of the scene and um, still are, in a lot of ways, the main inspiration for a lot of people. But there's so many of us that came up under them and along with them that, you know, are finally getting to um, have our music heard and learning how to put it out ourselves or learning how to, you know, take a, a business approach to be able to not compromise our music but still be able to reach people. Definitely. So is there any contact? Do you have a contact? Do you have a contact? Do you really kick it back in the day or is it not? No, we didn't kick it like that. I mean, it was like everybody was at the same open mic at the same showcases. So it's not like, you know, I would call them and say, what up, though? Everybody you know what I'm saying? Everybody just knew each other's scene. You nodded, yeah. what up? How you doing? I saw you last week at the open mic. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to yeah, see you yeah. next week at the open mic. Yeah. It wasn't a thing where we were homies or we were collabing yeah. on songs. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Definitely. But he was a respectful dude. He was part of the scene. But I'm saying, like... To me, it's unfortunate to see how, you know, like, like not blaming it on M, but the larger system of everything and how he kind of fed into it, of like perpetuating certain, um, a certain culture. So basically, like the the unfortunate thing to me is that you know, for a long, for a lot of people and for a long time, Eminem kind of outshined the rest of the scene due to the fact that he was a white rapper with skills that, you know had these gimmicks that he was kind of feeding into to further, you know, appeal to that, you know, large-scale white audience, you know what I'm saying? But the scene that he comes out of is, like, hundreds of skilled MCs that kind of, he was in the, he was in the training grounds with, he was in the boot camp with trying to get his lyricism up there and stuff like that, so, so yeah, so now it's just up to people who want to see that shift to support those artists, you know what I'm saying? Especially the independent cats who are doing things on their own and, a lot of us in Detroit, we just end up, you know, touring Europe all the time. And out here, you know, maybe you don't have the same level of fame, but the impact you make with your music when you don't compromise is much stronger. It's just much more healing. Yeah. The government in Detroit, the mm -hmm. city of Detroit. Okay. If you could ask them to change one thing or to fix one thing to make Detroit a better place, what would it be? Well, first of all. We don't ask here, we just make the change we want to see. Yeah. The government here is, you know, very corrupt and a lot of people in the community organizing movement here, which is an incredible legacy, like the musical legacy here is one thing, the movement legacy here is immense as well, you know what I'm saying? And they go hand in hand in a lot of ways, but, you know, the, the movement here is, is really on some almost parallel government stuff, like they are doing the things that a lot of time the government doesn't do. So maybe the schools aren't functioning well, but people might start their own school, or maybe there's an empty lot and not enough grocery stores, but people plant a garden, you know what I'm saying? Or maybe there's a, a lack of spaces for people to um, to be able to communicate and solve their problems without dealing with police, and people start uh, an alternative to police called Peace Zones for people to call them instead, or maybe people are getting kicked out of their home and foreclosed, and the government refuses to change the policy on foreclosure, so people just reverse the foreclosure and come and move them back in their house and change the lock, you know what I'm saying, yeah. and turn the water back on. So to me, you know, I'm just inspired by that movement. And if I could ask or tell or demand that the government would do anything different, is to support that more or to get out the way. Listen, I got a passion for spitting, smashing the competition. Vocals a logo for the back to back. World champion pistons, undebatable. Flesh is biodegradable. People ego deflatable. See no evil and play the role. I'll be the Gabriel with a sledgehammer. Let's stand, it's ready.